Hi, and welcome to a unified view of healthcare data, a strategic perspective. My name is Jeanette Weider, and I'm Managing Editor of Healthcare Innovation. I'm joined here today with Eugene and Chris and Ravi. So why don't we begin by introducing yourselves, your title, your background, your role. Eugene, would you like to go first? Sure. So uh, my name is Eugene Posnikoff. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Cybex, a uh, company that is focused on uh, data management in healthcare and life sciences. Um, I've been working as a uh, uh, IT uh, manager, executive, and founder in several companies in the past and in the enterprise space for the past 20 plus years and uh, found the company three years ago, and now it's uh, developing uh, kind of in a, uh, reaching its uh, new stage. Thank you. Chris? Uh, my name is Chris Maresca. I'm the CTO at Cybex. Um, I've been uh, involved in engineering enterprise systems for 25 plus years. Um, I've done a number of startups and had a number of exits in, in several different verticals, and am now uh, working with the engineering team at Cybex and developing uh, great solutions with Denota. Great. And last but not least, Ravi. Thank you, Jeanette. Happy to be here. My name is Ravi Shankar. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Denodo. Denodo is a, a data virtualization, data integration, and a data management vendor. Uh, we have a unique approach to bringing the data together from multiple different systems into a common view that will enable uh, uh, business users to consume the information without having to replicate it, which is called data virtualization. And um, it, we have many healthcare customers who are actually using our solution very successfully for those purposes and uh, making it uh, really good use, especially like in the COVID situations, which I'll probably get into in this discussion. Okay, great. So right now, especially because of the COVID situation, there's been a real focus on digital transformation efforts in the healthcare space. Um, so when it comes to clinicians and patients, what are some of the pain points you guys are seeing in organizations, um, information access, decision making? So probably I can, uh, I can start uh, on that, Jeanette. So um, this is uh, definitely not a uh, new problem. The access to information and data fragmentation uh, uh, issues with interoperability and handoffs uh, have been in healthcare for, for a long time. And um, uh, the, uh, the COVID situation essentially exacerbated existing problems, uh, made them sort of come to the forefront. So uh, I think uh, not to say that this is uh, you know, a, a positive event by no stretch of imagination, but it certainly uh, added to the uh, uh, focus of healthcare organizations and in general, the healthcare participants on the fact that uh, clinicians need faster and more convenient and more um, efficient way of accessing uh, patient and clinical information um, and uh, uh, this is something that in pretty much any conversation, any discussion today, you're going to hear the same uh, story. We need information access. We need quality information, which is uh, very uh, important. And so this is a subject that carries across both the IT side of the providers and the clinical space and the patients pretty much Unfortunately, any of us can be in that situation to understand how do we deal with uh, our own data, our own information. I can possibly you know, jump in with a little bit more information to, to add on to what Eugene basically said. Um, I think what uh, you know, COVID basically brought upon is that um, this is an industry that has been from a technology perspective behind in certain uh, some cases compared to other uh, industries like financial services, which actually spends about 6% of the revenue in their uh, technology compared to like 2% in the healthcare space. And uh, what happened is that uh, as soon as this, the COVID basically came about, that constrained many different things from a hospital staff perspective, from a processes perspective, a lot of patients coming in. And given the digital transformation, Janet, that you talked about, 
you cannot run the business without any technology uh, footing, right? If it's very deeply ingrained from a technology perspective, since the technology was kind of antiquated, could was not flexible, couldn't really uh, move forward. Many different healthcare uh, systems actually started becoming very constrained. For example, uh, physicians were had to kind of pivot from being physical to taking telehealth appointments, video appointments, phone appointments, and uh, not only the, the, the physicians and uh, the, the providers were trained to kind of do that, it was also from a patient's perspective. They, we, we have been used to going into the clinic, going into the hospital to get the service, suddenly kind of you know, powering up the laptop or the phone and you know, showing things here and there, really put a burden on the system in terms of being able to make this work. So initially, uh, in last year, March, thereabouts, the healthcare system was really overwhelmed on a number of different uh, sites that we were you know, being attacked uh, from all different sites. And the technology being one of the core systems that was holding this together, started really uh, showing its uh, weakness being strained by not being able to accommodate the sudden change that has actually brought about. So we can get into some more details about that. Yeah, I would I would add to to Ravi and Eugene's statements that uh, even before the whole COVID crisis, um, we, we there are statistics out there that physicians during uh, visits, patient visits, are spending up to thirty percent of their time just staring at their computer screens. So um, that 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 is already a, an issue, and I think really fundamentally, it's about bringing the 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 relevant information to the clinicians at the right time and um, in an easily digestible format. And, and as Ravi said, we've seen that COVID and, and the crisis and the, and the pressures put on the healthcare system have absolutely exacerbated sort of the inability of current systems to deliver that, which is okay if you have the largesse of time and, and a little less of an extreme situation. But in the case of COVID it has really showed up that uh, things need to change and be better. Right. Good answers, everyone. So what are your thoughts regarding delivering healthcare data as services? What, what have you seen in, in your experience? I'll start. I think that one of the things that we've seen is that uh, data is, is incredibly fragmented in a lot of healthcare organizations. It exists in different silos provided by different vendors, and there's very little uh, until very recently in terms of interoperability between these systems. Everything is extremely proprietary and you have to kind of wire everything up together in a custom basis. And it's not helped by the fact that every healthcare institution is essentially an island of its own practices and its own ways of doing things. And so the ability to replicate that between institutions is also difficult. So, um, that that has been a, a a difficult situation. Luckily, you know we've had a new set of standards that have been put forward by the federal government in in the case of fire that um, encourage interoperability both internally and externally. And I think that's a very positive development that's going to help the entire industry move things forward. That's a good point, Chris. And uh, to kind of add to that, and I can bring in some practical examples of some of the. Uh, some my healthcare customers, how they kind of reacted to situations like these. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, the, the, the COVID basically brought up on the strain across from multiple different facets, from the technology perspective, from the provider perspective, from a process perspective. And uh, one of the things that happened is if you kind of remember at that time, there was not enough PPE, in fact, for the physicians, right? They did not have enough masks, uh, enough uh, equipment to protect themselves to be able to treat the influx of uh, the COVID patients that were actually coming. So in fact, one of my healthcare customers, what they did was they were actually using our technology, the data virtualization uh, for other purposes, and they had to quickly react um, to uh, the COVID situation. So they started putting new policy that a physician or a healthcare provider who comes into the hospital needs to first self-declare themselves that they do not have a fever, they do not have the symptoms, only then they will be allowed to come inside the facility. 
Um, so for which they had to create quickly stand up a form that these people can actually fill in. Somebody has to validate it from making sure that the person who is submitting is the person employee that works at the facility and be able to um, clear the access for them to come into the facility. And the second thing is once they come in, do they have adequate supply of the PP uh, equipment for these physicians? How much do they have in stock? How much they can actually you know, give out? How much they need to source? From where do they source? So all those things they had to kind of do. And the third thing is like the patients coming in, do they have enough beds? Do they have able to kind of manage all these things? They had to quickly react to all these different things. And that's where like the data virtualization, they were able to use this to basically stand up um, these new forms, new um, uh, technology uh, parts that, that mirrored or, or satisfied the policies that the hospital put in place in order to assess the, uh, the employee's health before they come in, in order to make sure they have enough PPE equipment before they actually come in and then they can be served. So those are all enabled by the, the, the data uh, services and the technology that is in place to be able to deliver and the flexibility that comes with that particular architecture to be able to del quickly turn around and support these things that come about. Yeah, I think uh, one quick comment uh, I'll, I'll just add to uh, Chris and Ravi's uh, statements and, and, and uh, descriptions is that we've seen, an, uh, I think, uh, an, a significant uptick in requests that come to us from uh, organizations, both uh, uh, large and smaller size, that are looking for ways to be more efficient because they realize that... Um, uh, the whole sort of story with kind of a crisis situation is moving them to try to find, uh, look for ideas and, and find, uh, be more flexible uh, in ways that they operate uh, their day-to-day um, uh, -day activities and kind of looking forward into a, a more proactive strategy. So for us, as, as someone who delivers uh, services based on different types of technologies, working with a company such as Denoto, uh, we see this as an opportunity to engage in this dialogue in a very constructive fashion. So for us, it's been uh, an, an opportunity to engage in, in a very um, sort of proactive, dynamic, and very constructive uh, discussion with both technologists and clinicians that we talk to. So uh, in fact, we're, we're in a launch situation pretty much right now in, in some of these initiatives, which we'll be able to talk about maybe in about a month or two. And one of the things I, I would add to what Eugene said is that um, one of the other trends that we're seeing as, as uh, health systems are strained by COVID and also by um, people leaving the, uh, the, the health services um, is that uh, there's a much more federated approach to providing healthcare. Um, you know, people are bringing in um, specialists from outside organizations to work within their institutions to provide certain specific set of services. Um, and that is leading to uh, the need for more data interchange between uh, systems and between organizations. And um, that, that's only a good thing because we've all been in the case of you know, where you're a patient, a new patient somewhere, and you have to fill out 50 pages of forms because nobody can exchange, seem to exchange the data between each other. So um, that's the other thing that we're seeing is sort of a more federated approach to delivering care, which as patients we've all used, but the health systems have been largely siloed again, like they are internally, but also externally. So this is probably a good segue into my next question. What are some of the technical challenges you're seeing for healthcare organizations? What, what are they looking to address right now? I can probably you know, start, start us off on, on that Please. particular front. So Chris talked about like the federated or the distributed way of being able to access information. Now, we know that the, um, all the healthcare related information is distributed across multiple different systems you have. Uh, your EMR, you have your, you know, EHR, you had your, you know, the pharmacy systems, um, you have your ER system. So there are multiple different ones. As a, as a 
physician or as a clinician, you want to be able to see a unified view of that information. Suddenly you have a patient showing up in the ER, you know, what are the drugs of, for which they are allergic to? What has been their previous history? So what are the medications I can and cannot give? You need to be able to view all that information right at that particular point. But it is all not, it is not possible to do that because all this information is siloed across multiple different systems. So this is true that in, within the healthcare setting, we need a unified view of the patient information, unified view of uh, you know, the physician information. So all these things provide a integrated view that is needed to see like who has been caring for this particular patient uh, so that I can reach out to them. They could, could or could not be within the same hospital. They probably came to this hospital because it was nearer to them and they were really dying. So all these things require the information to be integrated and to be able to deliver at the point of care. And the challenge has been not being able to have um, a technology infrastructure and architecture that enables bringing this information together because it's exploding like the number of visits that the patients have, um, those information is kind of multiplying. There's no way we can actually physically move all that information into a central system, which has been the challenge. And that's where we advocate and some of our customers have used the federated or the virtual way of integrating the information. You keep the data wherever it is, but try to gain a unified view of that information for the treatment purposes um, by bringing together that information in a logical fashion rather than a physical fashion and, and trying to uh, put it into a repository. So um, the, the challenge has been, again, distributed information. And the solution for that is to leave the data wherever it is, not collect it into a central repository, but connect to wherever the information is and have a unified view of that information across the point of care. Yeah, I would, to add to what Ravi said, I think um, I'll give some more, uh, some concrete examples of this. We're working with one organization that has at least tw information on patients in at least 21 different systems. And um, right now, uh, a clinician would have to log into at least a dozen systems in order to see a complete view of the patient data. And you can imagine this is kind of a disaster in an emergency situation, right? It's, it's not great. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that, that's not a, a terrific um, situation. So bringing all that data to a single, as I said before, to the right data at the right time in a consumable format is really important. Um, on the other uh, end of this is another organization we've been working with that has a situation where um, they are also running uh, community services like food banks. And so you can imagine a situation where a patient would be prescribed certain types of food to get at the food bank. But of course, how do you integrate this non-clinical system now in that environment? You have to build an infrastructure that is capable of telling your ERP system or your catering system or a food bank system, this is what the patient needs because medical treatment is not just, making people better is not just about what happens in a hospital or a uh, medical um, environment. It's also about what happens to them when they go home, you know, and um, more and more of that is becoming relevant as people realize that the way people are living or the conditions that they live in or whatever their access to food, certain types of food um, becomes relevant. So you want to try to integrate all of that, um, you know, into, into your clinical um, capabilities. And, and that becomes very difficult because None, no systems right now are really designed for that. It's all being done on, a, you know, you're writing a paper prescription, giving it to them kind of thing. Um, so that's an important point as well, I think. Yeah, geography and demographics um, play a significant role in, in the healthcare uh, space, right? I mean, you're, uh, Ravi was mentioning delivering data at the point of care. So uh, we're witnessing a significant move right now of the demographic of baby boomers, you know, uh, uh, retiring and exponentially moving into into um, a kind of a retirement stage of their life. The millennials coming in, uh, different approach, different view of how to uh, address the healthcare needs. And uh, for a healthcare organization, this presents a challenge of how to be flexible 
how can I, you cannot, uh, you know, if, if you're just a hammer, everything else for you is a nail. So looking for uh, the flexibility and, and adoption of um, uh, this uh, flexible way of doing business, if you want to call it that, or addressing the needs of different populations based on geography and demographics is something that uh, the healthcare organizations need to address. And that's definitely something that we believe that we're, we're uh, helping them with. I believe another significant one would be migration to the cloud and cloud architecture. Do you guys want to share any experiences about that? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think, oh, I'm sorry. A, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, there's a, there's a couple of different interesting things here. I mean, first of all, you know, the, the, the cloud sort of writ large gives you access to uh, computing um, possibilities that you simply can't implement realistically internally. Uh, and that's that's the first thing. That's the first attractive thing for a lot of people is all of a sudden you can you can leverage things like AI and big data and machine learning and those kinds of things in a way that would be very difficult to do on premise. You'd have to spend enormous amounts of money on infrastructure to make that happen. Um, the other thing that's not so obvious is that the cloud, in fact, may be a more secure environment for healthcare data than on premises. We've seen a number of um, cybersecurity attacks on and ransomware on healthcare organizations, and and honestly, they you know, it, it's very difficult to replicate the kind of security that a large cloud provider can provide uh, on premise. It's it, you you are especially in healthcare IT, you're spending money on things that matter to to the clinical outcomes and not necessarily on on uh, you know uh, a um, cybersecurity defense team. Um, so it, 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 uh, it, it is something significant. We've seen this also that, you know, the, the, the real problem becomes how do you ship data back and forth, you know, and not ship all the data, which might be in the pendabyte range. You're not going to upload all that to the cloud. So what do you, what do you, how do you manage that process of moving the data around and uh, a solution like Denodo, you know, coupled with Cybex's, um, um, healthcare specific modules is is an ideal way of doing that, and we have a number of common clients that are um, looking at this as a as a way to access cloud more readily. And uh, the cloud was uh, an accelerator last year during the COVID time. So if you actually go back and what happened from a healthcare setting, we know that hospital had to postpone um, elective surgeries, which is where they make a lot of their money. So the revenue started basically dipping down. And also from a COVID perspective, many of the things were made free. So they had to get the reimbursement coming from the government side. So all this put pressure on the IT side where they actually decreased the budget that the IT CIO actually had to spend. First of all, they had lower amount of money compared to any other industry. And they had to make do with even reduced number and sometimes reduced staff too. So cloud became very attractive. They couldn't actually put all the money into capital expenditure maintaining the data centers. So the cloud is somewhere they could shift the cost on an operational expenditure perspective. So there was a huge migration to the cloud, but it is not so easy transitioning the applications from the on-premises of the data centers to the cloud. In many other industries, commercial industries, you actually see equivalent uh, applications but in a healthcare side, very many of these applications are very custom made for the institution. And it's not a lift and shift that you can just take it from there and just put it into the cloud and expect everything to work. So a lot of these things require re-architecture and time and resources. So that's where you know, technologies like data virtualization can come in, do some kind of an abstraction where the business users, like the physicians, clinicians can actually continue to get the data that they need while the IT takes the time to to make the transition from their data centers to the cloud. So, um, so that is something that uh, is, some, is, is not going to go back anytime to you know, the way it was before. Cloud is going to be the future. And I think this will be a lesson for the CIOs within the healthcare organizations to actually strategically plan and uh, provide that as uh, a technology enabler. It's, it's, a, it's a very sensitive subject, actually. If we leave technology aside for a second, I mean, clearly we've seen examples uh, in the last uh, year, year and a half, two years, where uh, different healthcare organizations have uh, made deals with cloud providers, uh, offered uh, or 
move the data, uh, de-identified data, uh, hopefully, uh, to a cloud provider. And that created an uproar because uh, it uh, supposedly can be leveraged for uh, uncontrollable use from a commercial perspective. So uh, that's, uh, that's a subject that's been kind of going on and, and, and a hot subject and a hot potato, so to speak. Uh, AWS was at the forefront of that about a year and a half ago. And uh, nevertheless, um, I think the dialogue between the healthcare organizations and the cloud providers is happening right now to the point that uh, Chris was making from a security perspective and leveraging the economies of scale on the one hand, on the other, uh, providing uh, the uh, sort of uh, walled off garden for de-identified data and encryption of that data for usage in uh, drug discovery, in uh, patient outcome analysis, um, so, uh, going back to your original question, we absolutely see the uptick and you don't have to go that far. I think Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, about a week or two weeks ago announced that they've signed an agreement with uh, Google, um, you know, as far as uh, operating a, a, a data project with them. So things are, are, are uh, happening and intensifying in that area. Thank you. So I want to circle back. I think, Chris, you mentioned FIRE, if I'm not mistaken. So do you um, see any of the policies that have been introduced in the past few years having an impact on technology decisions? Is it good? Is it bad? Blessing? Curse? Well, so, I mean, one of the reasons why we started Cybex was because FIRE provided an opportunity for data standardization and normalization across all of these different data silos, both internally and externally. So unlike past efforts, we now have a standard we can aim towards to normalize data uh, that will help with interchange between systems internally and, and externally. And we've been building infrastructure that does that for the past three years now. And it, it's quite successful processing, uh, I think hundreds of thousands of transactions a month right now through that. Uh, and our, our strategy is to normalize to fire where we can. And so I think that that's a very powerful tool. I think uh, just having a standard is awesome, right? You, you, you can't really do data interchanges. It, it winds up being a one-off every single time. And that's just not scalable, both from resources and people. As far as the Cures Act itself and things like pricing transparency and so on, I think the effects of that are still unclear. I think we, we still run across organizations where they're unsure what their strategy is for the whole Cures Act, which seems a little, a little behind the ball, if you will. But, uh, but I, think, um, I think it's going to have a net positive effect on, on, on the healthcare industry. As Ravi said, one of the big, big problems is that every single institution has basically customized even off the shelf software to death. And so then trying to bring all that back to some kind of a normalized standard view of data is relatively complicated. And, and that's the real stumbling block in all of this. Um, luckily there is a standard now, so that's one thing. But I'm sure Robbie has some other thoughts. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and we welcome that. So our healthcare customers, the healthcare technologists, very much um, you know welcome this uh, the the fire standards that have been come on board. We have always had like the HL7 standards for a very long time to exchange information across the different applications, but the fire basically provides a way to kind of access this information over an API interface, and uh, it provides a lot more benefits. Um, now, within the and data virtualization, we have been exposing the data from all these disparate sources as data objects and making that available as uh, REST services, for example, or APIs or other ways for uh, consumers to consume the data objects into multiple different applications. Now, for the healthcare specifically, the FIRE provides an opportunity for us to deliver that within the healthcare applications. And uh, we at Dinodo very much jumped on it to immediately support that and our healthcare customers actually welcome that and uh, they're beginning to use that within their applications. To maybe add uh, a, a less uh, sort of a, a more consumer oriented perspective, I think that as 
as consumers of healthcare, we are unfortunately have been used to the fact that we are always sort of sandwiched into a policy or a, or a provider of some sort or the, you know a carrier. And so our thought processes um, are more around, uh, we, we don't think about healthcare as a consumer uh, most of the time. Uh, it's just because the way the healthcare industry is structured and the limitations. However, from a policy perspective, something that is not discussed as much, uh, but something that we need to start appreciating more is that the patient now becomes the owner of their data. So uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a patient as a, uh, or as a consumer, uh, it is mandated that any provider, anybody who has ever provided a service to someone like myself and any other individual should make that uh, information available to them and not only that, we are able to share that information with any provider or any family member or whoever we designate as the recipient of that information. And that is actually a breakthrough and not very much, again, discussed, but something that I believe is going to start affecting uh, people's decisions, what they see, how they uh, own their data, and uh, should probably start impacting how providers uh, deal with that because you can't just hide it somewhere in a dark box anymore and kind of, uh, you know, not, not make it available. It's just something that is very, very uh, sort of hidden in the corner somewhere. So very important piece of regulation and something that needs to be looked at very closely. Well, we're almost through on time. So I wanted to ask if you had any of you had any final thoughts for our audience today? Um, yeah, I think I think that I mean there, there's 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 definitely um, changes afoot around uh, technology's ability to make healthcare delivery more efficient, and I think uh, the, I think the real aha moment really for for I think not just for healthcare but almost everybody in um, in business is that COVID really proved the primacy of technology in our modern world. Somebody said to me that we wouldn't have survived COVID without the internet, which sounds a little extremist, but it's probably very true. And it's put a renewed focus on the ability of technology to really deliver when push comes to shove. And I think that things like fire and um, data virtualization and distributed data interchange and you know, remote patient monitoring and all the things that we've seen during COVID are going to lead people to look again at how they're delivering care and hopefully for the better and for all of us. That was very well put, thank you. Um, and I, please. Right. And, and I would probably you know, equate the health and technology as being analogous. Now, we are talking about healthcare. We talk about our own health, right? You know, there is always that you eat right, you exercise well, take care of your health. When something happens, hopefully it is not too bad that you can recover much faster. Same thing for the technology, too, that you want to have the right systems in place. You want to have a flexible um, architecture in place so that something like COVID happens upon at a very short notice, you will be able to react and do continue the care and be able to even expand to meet the needs of it. So have that flexibility in your architecture, um, in your data architecture, especially to be able to meet circumstances like these. And the last but not least, Eugene, please. Yeah, no. Um, uh, so um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges uh, that we've seen and experienced is it, Part of it is technology, but a significant part of it is the, uh, the dialogue between the clinicians and the technologists. Uh, there has to be a continuous dialogue because uh, there is very often a situation where uh, the clinicians are not involved in some of the decision-making and the planning and uh, vice versa. You know, So uh, there should be no illusion when you entering the space that anything is going to be easy. Um, we keep talking about the data fragmentation in healthcare, and there's a reason for it. And rather than uh, brushing that off as a problem, we should address it from a perspective of the clinical view. 
because you're going to have cardiologists looking at, at a different set of data and a very different way of reviewing it. You're going to have primary care physicians, uh, you know, in a different set of, of rules and regulations and how they work with the patient. So uh, it's something that has to be part of your DNA when you're building a system, when you're building a solution is bringing together the parties that are involved in that, uh, you know, to have that dialogue, because otherwise it's going to be futile. So I think that's, that's one of the most important lessons that I believe we'll learned in the past year and a half, two years. Great. Thank you so much for all of you for sharing your perspectives today. And I, I hope you can join us again on another panel soon. Thank you. Thank you.